Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for making it here so early this morning, despite the bad weather. Let me first extend my uh, New Year's greetings, although it is a little bit too late, to every one of you, and I hope that uh, the year 2010 is a uh, very fruitful and prosperous year for all of you. Let me also say that I am very glad and happy to be able to introduce to you Dr. Arlen Sinai today as our guest speaker. As you know, Dr. Arlen Sinai is the chief economist and president of Decision Economics, a uh, very famous and world-leading uh, consulting firm located in uh, New York, Boston, and London, and serving more than 300 uh, financial institutions and various governments and corporations all over the world. Uh, Dr. Sinai is going to give a uh, very interesting and uh, uh, exciting, uh, I think, uh, subject today. And he will uh, give us the prospects of the U.S. and world economies. He will, uh, I think, carefully evaluate the uh, nature and uh, special features about the currently ongoing uh, uh, global economic recovery. I think he will also uh, discuss some of the uh, looming uh, legacies and side effects of the many policies undertaken uh, for the last, last couple of years uh, to combat the recent Great Recession. I think he will also uh, discuss uh, some of the uh, policies going forward in major economies to put their economies back on a uh, path of sustainable growth. Well, I think I don't need to spend much time to tell you who uh, Dr. Sinai is because uh, he has been with us so many times in the past. I think you are all very familiar with him by now. So I'll be very brief uh, to comment about uh, his career. Well, he has been a foremost uh, financial and economic forecaster on Wall Street ever since he uh, established his own company, uh, Decision Economics, in 1996. Before that, he actually was working with uh, Lehman Brothers, which is so famous name to us by now. And he worked there as a chief economist and managing director between 19, 1983 and 1996. I think he, he left too early. He should have stayed there longer. If he did, I'm sure the uh, Lehman Brothers wouldn't have, en wouldn't have ended up like the way it did about a year and a half ago. Well, uh, before joining the uh, Lehman Brothers, he worked with so-called uh, TRI, Data Resource Incorporated. As you know, the DRI was founded by late uh, Otto Eckstein, a legendary professor from Harvard University. And uh, he worked there as a uh, chief economist and a senior vice president. And while he was working with uh, Otto Eckstein, they both together developed a uh, econometric model of the U.S. economy which was at the time very, very famous among economic profession. Well, uh, he uh, received 
his uh, doctoral degree from Northwestern University in economics. And now I think it's time for me to present uh, Dr. Sinai to you. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction uh, and uh, the familiarity with uh, a, a long background for me uh, over 30 years, over three decades, approaching four decades of doing the kind of work that I still do and love to do, uh, economics, much of it science in our laboratory, but applied to economies, financial markets, and to policy. Today I want to divide my remarks into uh, three segments. The first is to uh, give a short version of what happened, the economic and financial crises in the United States and the world. And second, to talk about policies in the U.S. and world that have been used. Third, to take a look at the prospects, the aftermath, the legacies, the byproducts, problems, and the picture going forward, not just for the United States, but as we see it for all of the, uh, all of the world. The crisis itself and U.S. as an engine of the economic and financial crises that we – that are over, the worst of these crises are over, and the set of issues and the look ahead is very different – uh, than it was starting four or five years ago as we <coughs> moved toward that crisis situation. Uh, but in the U.S., for various reasons, uh, in asset markets, residential real estate and in the stock market, and in credit and debt, we had huge booms long in the making Lots of reasons for it. The reasons are the subject of another day. But out of the business cycle in the United States, the globalization of economies and financial markets, the policies taken, monetary and fiscal, came a huge boom in residential real estate as part of the expansion. And the use of that asset residential real estate as collateral for both borrowers and lenders, the leveraging up of that asset, development of a lot of businesses and financial institutions around the derivative businesses and transactions of that asset, and a, a boom in residential real estate and a boom in housing prices, which in turn, because of what we think are the natural endogenous forces of the business cycle in any country was used as a lever for aggressive spending and finance in the United States, contributed to a strong stock market, tremendous growth in credit and credit businesses, and in debt held by American consumers. Uh, an unsustainable boom and booms and unsustainably high and rising prices of two key assets for any economy, real estate, residential real estate, equities, and later on commercial real estate. Now this part is not unfamiliar. Business cycles throughout history, ups and downs in activity and financial markets and in finance, lending, borrowing have many times been accompanied by excessive booms and rising prices of assets, real assets and financial assets. Most typically, it occurs in real estate. I, I need not belabor this for you here in Seoul or in the Asia area of the world because Asia itself, Hong Kong, Japan, Korea, many countries, perhaps China now, have gone through the booms 
and the excesses, and the price rises for assets, which sometimes get so excessive that they can be called bubbles, and then something happens, the prices come tumbling down. That happened in residential real estate in the United States. Some of us picked this up early. Uh, some did not. It's fairly rare. But if you are a student of business cycles and have been studying and analyzing them and doing the kind of work I've done for almost four decades, uh, it wasn't unfamiliar. Japan had it in the 1980s. The United States had asset price bubbles, booms in the 1920s, 1930s. What's unusual is to have two or three or four of them at the same time. In the United States, not only did we have a, a real estate asset bubble, but because of the ability to fund with innovations in the financial system, to fund and take equity out of residential real estate, and then to deploy that equity for spending, for investments, buying stocks, buying stocks, buying more real estate, prices go up, borrow, buy stocks, buy real estate, spend on consumption, the double boom in residential real estate and in stocks and in the credit and debt that went along with the spending in those booms created a multiple set of booms and price bubbles for those assets and liabilities in the U.S. economic and financial system. Now, when interest rates were raised, the, the chairmanship of Chairman Greenspan, slowly from very low levels, and got to 5 or 6 percent. And the momentum of growth in the housing boom slowed. That triggered a reduction in the ascent of housing and re residential real estate prices. And then what clicked in is something we economists call uh, the accelerator effect. It's a change in the rate of growth, which sets into motion reverse movements in activity and asset prices that occurs at the top of a boom and then sets an economy going down. And of course, along with those booms came excesses in finance. Uh, unregulated, unsupervised activities relating to housing and other derivative activities and financial businesses in the U.S. financial system, which by this time had blurred the lines between traditional banking, investment banking, trading, so that numerous financial institutions, non-banks, were engaged in bank-like activities. Indeed, research is showing that the lending and deposit gathering activities traditionally in the domain of commercial banks essentially resided in the investment banks, the venture capital, private equity, hedge fund, financial institutions that grew up around the boom in the price bubbles. Uh, and those financial institutions are not transparent. They were outside the net of the regulators. Within the banking system, the regulators uh, didn't watch very closely. Uh, and the pursuit of money, greed in the system, materialism in the U.S. society and economy got the better of everybody. And a mania turned into a bust. Uh, that decline in residential real estate prices, the first in decades, as it unfolded, as the boom turned to bust in residential real estate and the price bubble burst, then radiated through the system, the financial system, and hit and hurt the U.S. equity market because so many financial institutions by that time, the financial sector in the U.S. stock market were 25 percent of uh, the market capitalization. And those financial institutions' stock prices began to come down. 
balance sheets of financial institutions, banks and non-banks, contracted as asset prices came down. The leveraged expansion, debt and capital market finance expansion of the balance sheets for bank and non-bank financial institutions that had fed the boom turned around, balance sheets contracted, credit contracted, the stock market fell. The decline in the equity market, which was very sharp, along with the decline in residential real estate prices, in turn took down the wealth of households massively. That, in turn, hurt consumer spending. And because the mechanisms of finance for American consumers shut down, namely mortgage refinancing on rising housing prices as an easy way to get funds because capital gains realizations, capital gains turned to capital losses. The combination of the long-time exposure of the American consumer, the indebtedness, uh, the credit that had been taken on, the very uh, aggressive spending on average by consumers, and the financial factor, decline in wealth, inability to fund through mortgage refinancing, loss of capital gains, capital losses, a deteriorated financial position of American consumers. We think the financial factor hit consumption hard, and for two or three quarters, we saw declines in the consumption in America that we had never seen before, probably hadn't happened since the 1930s. Uh, those declines centered around the second half of 2008, the first quarter of 2009. And interestingly, at that time, the economies of countries around the world also plummeted. Uh, and so uh, in one of the... Uh, handouts, uh, I'm not sure the charts and tables are there, uh, which you, you can look at later. Uh, what you see in, in, in the 47 countries that we cover and forecast and analyze are startling, stunning, sweeping, almost unbelievable declines in real GDP growth between the middle of 2008 and the second quarter of 2009. Incredible declines, which were part of the longest and deepest downturns along with financial crises around the world. The global downturn, the global recession, a great recession for the global economy on our numbers down 2.5% in 2009. This year to be up 3 and a third percent it's a big difference. That's a change of 6 percentage points of growth. And uh, the kind of uh, result at the time looked to me and others uh, inexplicable. We'd never seen it before. It's like a sickness the doctor had never seen in the patient. And to deal with a sickness, if you don't know what it is and haven't seen it before, and it's so widespread, like the swine flu, avian flu, epidemic, everywhere. The numbers are incredibly negative during that period of time. Uh, and of course, stock markets tumbled uh, on that news and went way down, and ultimately in the United States, we had the second biggest bear market in our history, second only to 1929 to 1933. On March 9th of 2009, the U.S. equity market was down almost 57% from its previous peak, and that is the biggest bear equity market in the United States since the early 1930s. Of course, for stock markets around the world, Similar results occurred, and then the effects of collapsed stock markets on the real economies interacted to bring economies down some more. Credit risk became greater. Financial institutions didn't want to lend to one another, didn't want to lend outside the financial system to the real sector, and events like the Lehman failure AIG uh, problem, government actions to support the system, uh, uh, completely uncharted territory, uncharted waters to navigate 
is what confronted the whole world. Well, what I've given you is our idea of the genesis of how it arose. It started in the United States. It's the result of years of excesses in the United States. And uh, it has many causes. In my work in research in the business cycle, I would say it was endogenous. It's in the system. And the role of the financial factor, and I've given you only a small version of it here, in the business cycle is nothing new. The financial factor in one form or another shows up at every business cycle, upturn and downturn. It is absolutely decisive in throwing economies into downturns at the upper turning points. And this financial factor was a combination of bursting price bubbles, excesses in credit and debt, excesses in leveraged, highly leveraged uh, use of debt finance by clever and innovative financial institutions doing what they thought they should do for their shareholders to maximize shareholder value, and the whole thing collapsed. Uh, we will not see this kind of event again to this degree in our personal and professional lifetimes. We will see again, because it happens in every cycle, the financial factor, the financial crisis, the financial crunch, not just in the United States. It will happen here again someday in Asia, various countries in Asia, because it has always been part of business cycles since the beginning of time. Bubbles, price bubbles and the bursting of them, the mania, the psychology around it, the greed that all societies inherently have in terms of pursuit of more money uh, is part of the human condition and human nature. The puzzle to me is, since it has recurred periodically and regularly in all business cycles that I have studied, of course this is a special area of research for me, so I'm more sensitive to it. And we know that it happens again and again, not just in the U.S., Japan had a similar situation. The U.S. in the 30s had a similar situation. Asia in the late, 1990, late 1990s had a similar set of crises. Fixed exchange rates motivated that, plus policy mistakes by the IMF that made it worse, in my view. Uh, since it always happens, why is it we haven't figured out how to deal with it so we can take actions? to make it less bad or prevent it from happening, much as we have learned to do with vaccines and medications that now have made obsolete so many of the illnesses that used to plague civilization. But it happens every time. I think that's part of why uh, in our own uh, forecasting and analysis we picked it up early. I think it's part of why policymakers around the world and the United States picked it up late. They were late in recognizing what they thought was a rare and unusual event and lost valuable time in policy reactions to cushion and prevent further weaknesses and excesses and then had to devise policies in extremis, in situations of extreme stress, in this case experimental policies, and of course there are lags in the formulation of them, the implementation of them, and in the time it takes before they actually have an impact. By the time the United States, our Federal Reserve, and our Treasury and administration, first the Bush administration, Congress, and then the Obama administration, got around to dealing with the problems and policymakers around the world, the dynamics of the downturns and the crises were way ahead of the policymakers, much as if I am a medical doctor, and take too long to treat a patient, what is initially wrong in the patient will spread to other organs of the body and the patient may die. Uh, being early pays when it comes to policy making, but I have yet to see any country, any set of policy makers able to do this given the nature of how policy makers get put into their jobs, the fact that they don't stay that long because memories are short and because private sectors in mixed capitalistic systems all around the world will act 
the agents in them will act the same way. And when you throw into it a dose of mania and herd instinct, uh, uh, the now what economists are looking at behavioral economics, you have the recipe for extremely volatile conditions. The essence, though, of this set of crises came from the U.S. The late 1990s came from Asia. And it was centered around the American consumer. And here's how it spread. Consumption in the United States, and I talked about this last year, on average, for 45 years up to 2005, had risen, inflation adjusted, 3.5% a year. That's Asia-like in the growth rate. It's a big number. That's a lot of consumption. Uh, by the time, uh, by 2006, 2007, consumption in the United States was 71% of GDP. When the financial factor in the business cycle centered on the consumer and consumer spending collapsed, that was 70%, 71% of GDP going down. China, alone among the countries that export to the United States, had increased its export exposure to the United States as a percent of its total exports. At the time, about 20% of total Chinese exports went to the United States. Housing, the housing industry doesn't buy a lot of stuff from China, buy some stuff from China. American consumers do. American consumers buy a lot from South Korea. We buy a lot from Japan. But over the last 10 or 15 years, the proportion of total exports from South Korea and Japan to the United States has gone down. But the proportion of South Korean and Japanese exports to China has gone up. When the exports of all three of those countries, very much tied to the American consumer, when the American consumer went down, so did those exports. And then the purchases of China from Japan and South Korea, the purchases of South Korea from Japan and China, and the purchases of Japan from South Korea and China tumbled, and trade fell and levered down the economies all over Asia. Something similar to this happened in uh, the Eurozone through Germany and to Canada as well. Along with the financial crisis intensified the downturn and the whole world economy went down. Now, we think the American consumer will not spend aggressively for a long time. Last year, I talked to you about the seismic shift of American consumers spending a lot less for a lot longer than ever before in our memory and saving a lot more for a lot longer than ever before. That is the process that goes on now. In the last three and a half years, consumer spending in the aggregate has risen, has grown about one and a quarter percent a year. That's nowhere near the historical three and a half percent a year. For any countries exporting to the United States, and particularly American consumer, the whole business climate changes. What I said last year, the year before, and I will say now, that is the way it's going to be for a long time. Consumer spending going forward will be positive, but its trend rate of growth will be far below what it was historically, and that means the exporters to the American consumer, businesses in the United States that sell to the American consumer, commercial real estate that used to have retail consumer space, all of that will be much worse business than ever before. Uh, it's a very, very big effect. Long run, perhaps healthy, because we in our country spent too much, borrowed too much, didn't save enough. That has changed immensely and goes on now as we speak. Why do we think it? The six major fundamentals of consumer spending in the United States that we watch continue to say negative things about the pace of American consumption. And in Washington, the policies that are being taken are not consumer-centric. And so we do not think that the fundamentals are yet right for American consumers to move back toward the aggressive pace of spending and borrowing that characterized our economy and society for four, five decades. Since it has never been that way in any of our memories, 
it takes time, if indeed what I say is roughly correct, for it to be impressed upon countries and people in the consumer business. But it's still going on, and it is still a major theme for us. Well, second set of comments, the policy reactions to uh, the version I have given you of how uh, the U.S. and the world got taken down, the role of the financial factor in it, and the way it spread. Uh, the policy reactions, when they finally came in the United States, were, as you know, on the monetary policy side, aggressive reductions on interest rates by the Federal Reserve. By the time that came, it was too late. The dynamics of the downturn were well in place, and the lags in response to those lower interest rates haven't yet even begun to uh, run out. Uh, in addition, uh, our Federal Reserve, and this indeed was quite ingenious, turned to quantitative easing, previously used only by Japan in a situation of uh, extreme distress. And first lent to the financial institutions to relieve the crunch within the financial sector, then lent to the corporate sector because the financial sector wasn't putting any money out and markets had shut down. Companies could not raise money. And then finally ended up being the lender of last resort, not just for banks, which is the classic central banking role, but for parts of the private sector of the American economy and for the U.S. mortgage market. In addition, the central bank, the Federal Reserve, decided to try to prevent our major financial institutions from collapsing. Uh, the record is spotty on this. Uh, Bear Stearns was a managed uh, bankruptcy. Uh, Lehman Brothers was probably an accident that if they had to do over again, they wouldn't have done it. AIG was saved. All of this at the expense of taxpayer money. The Treasury was part of it. And hand in hand, the Federal Reserve worked with the Treasury to prevent the major U.S. financial institutions from failing. Uh, they are now doing fine, most of them. Bank of America and Citigroup are still losing money, but all of the other major financial institutions, now called banks, because they applied for charters to be banks when the opportunity arose, <coughs> all of them, many of them are earning very good money. The Goldman Sachs results today were absolutely spectacular. Uh, J.P. Morgan Chase uh, has had very good earnings. And the funds that all of the financial institutions were given, some of them were forced to take, have been returned to uh, the Treasury. And indeed, our Treasury is making a little money because asset prices have gone up, and so is the Federal Reserve. Too big to fail. Yes, that's exactly what the Federal Reserve signed on to, well aware of the risks of ensuring that these very institutions who were being saved might then again in the future engage in the very same practices that had led us to our problem. Of the choices available, our Federal Reserve chose to downplay moral hazard, chose not to let financial institutions fail because the overwhelming view was that what had brought about the Great Depression, not a Great Recession, but a Great Depression, had been the collapse of credit and the banking system in the United States, whether right or wrong on that view, Chairman Bernanke was determined not to let that happen. Uh, and hence, too big to fail, and the saving of our financial institutions, most of which now are really uh, doing uh, well. Uh, there is no longer any crunch in the financial system. Plenty of funds available in the overnight market and the federal funds market. Banks are not lending because the credit environment tells them they should not lend, so we still have a crunch in the private sector. That's an overhang. And we do have a tremendous consolidation that's going on in the financial institutions, decimation of the private equity and hedge funds. Uh, they will come back to live another day and once again seek and gain capital and be aggressive in the deployment of that capital. But the leveraged finance and leveraged balance sheet expansion that fed the booms and the bubbles in the United States are long gone and will not be back in the United States for a long time, for a long time. Uh, the U.S. has entered a recovery 
Without the policies put into place, monitoring fiscal, our studies say that in 2009, rather than a 2.5% decline in real GDP, it would have been minus 6 or minus 7. Uh, I think actually the, uh, some results from that study are in one of the handouts. Uh, we did a uh, retrospective look at all the policies, monetary and fiscal, that were used in the Great Recession of 2007 to 2009, one by one and all together, asking what would have happened. This is in our large-scale model of the U.S. economy, econometric model. What would have happened to the U.S. economy if nothing had been done, if government had done nothing and the Federal Reserve had done nothing? The results are very interesting. All together, all of the monetary easing, interest rates, quantitative easing, a fiscal stimulus program in 2008 and the Obama $800 billion program in 2009. Uh, if we took, took all of those out, the U.S. economy would have been in 2009 four to five percentage points worse, six or seven percent down. That's not a great recession. That's a mini depression. Uh, not a great depression, but a mini depression. The uh, 2010 forecast if nothing had been done of this work, would be that we'd be down 2 or 3 percent in real GDP growth. For the U.S., we are forecasting plus 2.5 percent in 2010. That's not so good, but it's better than minus 4, minus 4.5. Four and, and think about the whole world economy. If the U.S. had gone down 6 or 7 percent last year and might head for down 4 percent this year, where would stock markets be today? And what would that mean to financial institutions, to your businesses in the United States and here in Asia? Because surely, if we had done nothing, China would have been damaged. Trade flows would not be as good as they are emerging here now. There would be stress on the systems, financial systems of all the countries, and Japan would probably be in a depression. It is in a contained depression now. Japan's situation is not very good. So uh, these policies... And policies taken in other countries all over the world, the Chinese fiscal stimulus, which was massive, uh, stimulus here in South Korea, stimulus, a couple of rounds of stimulus in Japan, fiscal stimulus in Germany, monetary ease, quantitative easing in Japan again, zero interest rates essentially in the UK, in Canada, near zero interest rates, and the support of the financial system and institutions, emergency support of central banks around the world. Uh, emergency medicine, uh, roughly, patients are back on their feet, some looking more healthy than others. Uh, it's a good thing. There may have been overkill. We could have done better. But with all that was going on in such a short period of time, the chaos, the stress, the unknown nature of the situation, uh, I think uh, the world has come through uh, quite well uh, on this. Now, uh, the aftermath, the future. You know, you have a patient whose heart stops, and these days we can resuscitate or try to, uh, those who know how to do CPR, and uh, if you have a cold blue in a hospital in any part of the world, uh, and the patient is uh, trying to be revived, uh, the doctors will do terrible things to the patient to get that heart beating, break ribs, all kinds of side effects, inject the person with all kinds of drugs. And many times, patients are resuscitated and go on to do well. We never used to do this. The side effects, the byproducts of the medicine used in the U.S. and around the world are part of the legacy and the look ahead in the future of what might happen. The uh, working out of the financial crises and what that has done in economy after economy is part of looking ahead and the legacies of the future. The initial conditions of the countries coming out of the economic and financial crises, the shape they are in to begin, how spry the patient is after recovering from that cardiac arrest. That's important. And of course the policies going forward that are applied, the medicines, the use of them, also very important. 
Now, here's what we see. In the United States, it looks like a decent recovery, a little bit stronger than the recovery after the recession of 2001 and 1990-91, but nothing like the V-like recoveries the United States has typically had after a deep recession. This recession in the United States, properly called the Great Recession, was the deepest and the longest since the 1930s. After deep recessions in the United States, the first year of recovery typically is real GDP growth of 6.5 or 7%. We're forecasting 2.5 to 3. It's better than nothing. It's better than minus 4%, but it isn't very good. And with that growth rate goes a, a legacy, a byproduct, side effect, a very high unemployment rate, now 10% in the United States, and a tremendous amount of joblessness when you add up the unemployed, underemployed, and discouraged workers. Some measure 17, 18 million people. In addition, because of all that slack in the labor market, businesses, no surprise, are pushing wages down. And businesses, in order to maximize profits and to maximize shareholder value, at least U.S. companies, don't really want to rehire people. They're very expensive. So the U.S. has, out of this crisis situation, an upturn, a recovery. We call it some sort of upturn, but it's not all that good. And it has as a byproduct tremendous unemployment. That's a huge economic, societal, and look at the election in Massachusetts yesterday, political problem in the United States. Washington has to and is trying to figure out what to do about it. In addition, the United States comes out of this with huge deficits. In the fourth quarter, 11% of GDP and a gross public debt to GDP ratio, because GDP growth doesn't look like it'll be all that strong, that we think will go over 100% in three or four years, given policies as they now exist and the structural nature of the budget plans of the Obama administration, including, though this is in doubt, some sort of health care reform, which net-net we think will cost the government more money than they are able to raise the fund. The U.S. comes out of this with still a large current account deficit. It's better than before. Exports are firmer. Imports are, have been down. And a lot of international indebtedness and huge holdings of dollars around the world and portfolios because of all the funding that the world has done for the U.S. all these years. And the supply of treasuries is massive on the deficits. $1.5 trillion this past fiscal year. We're estimating $1.4 trillion this coming fiscal year. We have $125 billion of foreign exchange reserves. We are deeply in debt. And politically, our country is having its difficulties. Uh, having its difficulties. That's how we come out of this. A patient whose heart stopped, emergency measures, no other alternative but to take chances with the patient to get the patient to live. And this list of initial conditions. When we look at Asia and Asia's performance during the crises, what we see is in China, now the, in 2009 on our numbers, China became the third largest economy of the world, surpassing Germany. On some numbers now here in 2010, certainly on our numbers in 2010 it will happen, China will be the second largest economy of the world. China's GDP is six times what it was 12 years ago. Japan's GDP is lower than it was 12 years ago. Yet Japan has been number two. The gap was that large. The U.S. is way, way up. Much higher GDP than China, Japan, and Germany. But it isn't really going anywhere. Where is the dynamism? Where is the momentum? Where is the growth? China. So what happened in China? China had what we would call a growth recession. At the low, their GDP grew at 6.1% year over year. 
China responded with massive fiscal stimulus, with very easy monetary policy, guiding lending and investment, pushing the system to do more of that. And China sits today with an economy, we'll see what the numbers are when they come out, uh, we think uh, 2010 the Chinese economy is going to grow 10 to 11 percent. That's too strong. And China is beginning to rein that in. The Chinese experience hardly damaged in these downturns. Now, even though we don't believe those GDP numbers, they're not really 6, 8, 10, 11 percent, and you scale them down, they had nothing worse than a kind of growth recession. Nothing compared to the Great Depression, Great Recession in the United States. India, a little lower growth, 8 to 9 percent. South Korea, sharply lower, but sharply higher in 2010 and 11. On our estimates, which may shock some of you, 6 percent plus or minus a little is our estimate of growth for South Korea this year and next year. That's a vibrant rebound. What we're seeing in the data, high-frequency data, is quite a rebound in the trade flows, in the exports and the import flows around the Asian, what I call, loop. And it's much the reverse of how the U.S. took Asia down through the American consumer. Once again, trade ties, trade flows are very tight in the Asian region. Export propensities to one another, import propensities from one another, and the businesses of open economies with inside and around one another, when those trade flows begin to sharply move up, that lifts the Asian economies into what I have in the past called orbit. They lift off because trade is such a big deal and the interactions are so tight. And the interactions are tighter now, relatively speaking, than they used to be with the United States. There is a decoupling going on. Business people in this part of the world understand where the dynamics of business and finance is going to be. They're living it, breathing it every day. Business people go where they can make money, where they can sell goods, where they can produce at lower costs. It is happening that way out here. And so when we look at the prospect for 2010, 2011, we see a V recovery and upturn and expansion in much of the Asia ex Japan world. And very vibrant business, surprisingly strong and very different in performance from the US, the UK, the Eurozone, the G7 world. We look at the initial conditions of China coming out of the great crisis, and what do we see? $2.4 trillion of foreign exchange reserves. The U.S. has $125 billion. We don't have enough foreign exchange to intervene on behalf of the dollar if it should collapse for the last more than a week or two because of the huge volume of transactions in the currency market. China can fix its exchange rate to the third decimal point for 18 months with all those foreign exchange reserves, and they just went up another few hundred billion. The Chinese deficit to GDP ratio, even after that fiscal stimulus, is something like 3 or 4 percent. And debt to GDP, because GDP is now rising so fast, is stable. The Chinese consumer, as portion of the Chinese economy, is approximately 40 percent. It has a lot of room to rise to 50 or 60 percent, and I believe that will happen as China, understanding that it no longer can sell into the U.S. the way it used to, will take measures to induce its consumers to spend more and to become more consumer-driven. And as that happens, the standard of living for the Chinese consumer, which is very low in per capita terms, will rise and wealth and well-being will rise in China. China is not an emerging country. There's no way I could describe a country that is about to become the second largest in the world. That is, although still by Western standards, somewhat lawless and a little bit totalitarian in the centralization of some of the functions of what goes on, has become increasingly a 
responsible global citizen, part of now something called G20. Seoul, Korea will be the site of G20 meetings in November. It used to be G2, then it was G3, then it was G7. G20 makes more sense. South Korea is the 15th largest economy in the world, and it's going to grow very fast. It is changing. The next year or two or three, five, ten years is not the decade of America. It's not the decade of Japan. It's the decade of Asia. The initial conditions put Asian countries in much better shape, more resilient. They bounced, not even, didn't even have a heart attack. They bounced up. They're in good shape. They've stayed in good condition. Worked out, probably at the fitness center in this hotel. It's a good place. And uh, are fine. So uh, we uh, have a view of the world uh, that, that, I, that I had before uh, all this crisis hit, uh, that the economic geography, the wealth of the world, is shifting and changing under our very feet, and it is the decade of China and Asia. X, any political confrontations, frictions, or within any single country, something going wrong internally in its society. Japan, uh, in our view, is out, left out of that, suffering from a significant deflation, having to wrestle with how to get out of that. Uh, there is no easy answer for Japan in terms of the current deflation. Hopefully, Japan can ride the wave of the upturn in Asian economies. So China this year for us, 10 to 10.5%. South Korea, 6%. India, 8 to 9%. Australia, very solid, very strong. Singapore, 7 to 8%. Very heady numbers, a return to the dynamic growth uh, world that Asia has known before. Uh, we saw this in the 90s, and then we had the Asian crisis. But in the 90s, so many exchange rates were fixed, the prosperity was false. And that indeed is a risk for China. Fixed currency, exports doing well, flood of money into the country, a bidding up of asset prices, and the risk that when someday they let that currency go, that they won't be able to manage it, and China will undergo boom bust, and that in turn will radiate through Asia and produce difficult times. It's not all hunky dory, you know. It's not all blue sky. There are plenty of risks out there, but uh, frankly, this part of the world is in much better shape than the United States is uh, is in. Well. For markets, uh, we obviously, in this stage of the upturn uh, in the world, recovery, then expansion, though with risk, are bullish on stocks as an asset class. We're overweight, and on an all-equity uh, global portfolio, we certainly would be overweight in uh, non-U.S., particularly in Asia, and in some of the so-called emerging countries, uh, we would be overweight. We do think this is a year of rising interest rates. A number of central banks will start to withdraw the artificial support. We are expecting to see South Korea raise interest rates this year. After all, we have a strong growth forecast for South Korea, probably stronger than the government. And inflation is beginning to tick up here. Uh, year over year, it's about 4 percent. That's a little high. And so, and the yuan is, uh, is also strong, and the yuan should be strong with this view uh, that we have on this part of the world. Uh, for global investors in the currencies, the economic performance, the economic growth is dominant. In Asia, ex-Japan, looks very appealing. Interest rates are likely to rise. China is already leaning against and starting to tighten or not be as easy a monetary policy. Australia has been doing it for a while. Uh, India will likely do it. South Korea, we are forecasting also. And that will tend to strengthen the Asian currencies against uh, the U.S., where we are not expecting interest rates to go up anytime soon. Uh, the Eurozone, where 1% will stay in place for quite a while. And, of course, Japan, where a, a zero-rate policy looks like, with deflation, it will have to be there forever. And so on growth and relative interest rates, there will be a tendency for Asian currencies to rise. And governments will have to decide uh, on whether to uh, sell uh, Asian currencies uh, because of competitive reasons on trade, not wanting their currencies to get too strong. But I think uh, even if they intervene and sell, 
they won't be able to stop the movement. And the Asian international travelers and buyers and business people will find that their real purchasing power, currency adjusted, is going to get very strong. Uh, to summarize, it is uh, terrific to be able to give uh, a upbeat outlook uh, after many years of being so gloomy in the prospects of the future in the audiences that I spoke. Uh, and that is the nature of, of the world economy in the U.S., recovery and expansion with risks, more or less depending on the part of the world. It follows that earnings will rise and stock prices will rise, and that's another reason to be update and to feel optimistic. We all feel better, I think, when stock markets go up than when they go down. For some strange reason, maybe because we all own stocks in one form or another. We like it when the stock market goes up. Interest rates are going to rise, but they're still pretty low. Central banks won't raise them a lot unless inflation gets out of hand. And on inflation, in some countries, there are hints that it may come back sooner and get out of hand, and some central banks may be behind on that and may surprise us with the hikes in interest rates. But even that, in the earlier stages of recoveries and expansion, don't really stop the good times from rolling. It is also a delight to be in the part of the world where the wave is best. Uh, I'm a fair weather friend. I, I can't really do anything much about our country. I do advise, uh, I have advised various governments, Republicans, Democrats, uh, on policies. Oh, 20 or 25 percent of the time, they, they, they actually do some of the things I say. I'm always surprised when that happens. But 70 or 75 percent of the time, they don't. And I go to Japan and I tell them what I think they should do. And uh, this time I told them they should take the currency down. They should get very aggressive and take the end. You have deflation, you need a lower currency. Deflation invites policies that take the currency down. They seem very confused on that. I don't think they're going to do it. So I'm used to uh, my advice on policy three quarters of the time not being taken. On markets and on economies, I have a higher batting average. But it is really a pleasure to be in front of an audience in a country where the future, to me, looks very, very bright as part of the world that is going to dominate in economics and the creation of wealth in coming years. And you know what? As an investor, it doesn't matter where I live. I know I can't do anything about policy because I'm not God. I don't make policy. And even if I were, my test tube results might not be the right results. We all, economists, think we can solve the problems in our laboratory. I can do it in my model. I can figure it out. Uh, but uh, that's a long way from actually doing the world. But as an investor, guess what? I can make money anywhere as long as I know the scoop on what's going on, roughly speaking, because I can move money. I can move my investments around. I can sell real estate. I can buy stocks. I can throw a little money out to a hedge fund. Uh, and if I uh, manage to escape uh, and head for the hills and go underground at those times of price bubbles bursting, and I think our clients did manage, not Lehman, they were a client, they got caught in the rainstorm. But if uh, you, can, you can do okay. You can't change what goes on, but if you understand what's going on, then in business and in finance, uh, you can still have a good time. So uh, on that Cheery note, I, th I think this is a lot cheerier than last year and the year before and the year before. Uh, let me close and see if we have time for some questions and comments. Thank you. Thanks, Sam, for your nice presentation. My name is Don Che from Hanra Securities. And, uh, uh, I want to ask you a uh, question about the uh, long-term outlook of uh, uh, China's economy. Uh, there are some people say that uh, China's uh, uh, GDP may be uh, bigger than the uh, U.S. in some say 15 years, some say 20 years. And even uh, Chinese official uh, says that uh, they may exceed uh, that of uh, U.S. GDP by uh, 2050. Uh, um, some argue that uh, with current regime, political regime, that the Chinese uh, economy cannot develop 
much larger. Uh, but some say that the Chinese um, uh, Asia may have own uh, um, what is say that uh, um, uh, philosophy and uh, regime and uh, keeping our own regime that the, uh, uh, we can still go further. Uh, I mean, in China too. Can I ask uh, your opinion on that? We we are we, we think China's GDP will come closer to or surpass U.S. GDP sooner than 15 or 20 years. Uh, second, there will be ups and downs. The, the, the view of the Chinese uh, economic expansion now uh, for us is uh, very strong, very dynamic over a two to three year period and then a, a slowdown but still good growth rates. There will be cycles in the growth rate of, of China. Uh, and uh, uh, but the, uh, the prospect for the United States in terms of its ability to grow and in Japan uh, suggests at best 3% a year. For the U.S., Japan may be less than that. And so you see just by the stint of the numbers the changing relative size of the economies. Uh, and if we look at Asia as combined China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, I, I'm not talking about political integration. I'm thinking just in terms of an economic lump. Uh, the Asian uh, world, uh, which is 13, 14 countries, not like the Eurozone, not in that integration, but as a geographical unit, uh, will far surpass in size. We'll, we'll move up in size relative to the Euro, Eurozone and North America in a very dynamic way. Uh, these are business cycles. I'm talking about longer run trends in our view. The initial conditions of this part of the world, South Korea, I think, is 250 or 300 billion dollars of foreign exchange. That's enviable. Uh, that as a percent of GDP, that's far above the United States. It has 125 billion. Uh, you know, the, the, the countries in this part of the world are, are relatively rich. Not, so, not as much in consumer standard of living as the United States, but as countries, they're rich. They don't have the deficits and debt we have. Uh, and look at the U.S., look at the U.K., I look at certain countries in the Eurozone. Uh, those initial conditions will carry a long, long way, but there will be cycles, and they could be vicious. The... Uh, Chinese currency is unsustainably low. Unsustainably low. We have learned in the past that the longer a currency is fixed, the greater are the excesses and imbalances that develop. And then, no matter how a country tries to exit from that fixed rate currency, typically they are forced to exit because they get runaway inflation. The central bank has to raise interest rates, and that creates a lot of problems for the economy, they're then forced to let the currency go, and that creates even more problems. So the longer China waits before it starts to adjust the currency and let it help it get back to where it should be, the more risky is it is for a boom-bust scenario in China. That, I think, is not unlikely to happen sometime in the next three or four years. We did not think that China, you, you know, two, three years ago, there was a, a theme running around that China would boom-bust. We didn't think that. But now, three, four years from now, that is definitely a possibility. The exchange rate has been fixed for too long in China. Chinese political system will look like within uh, 15, 20 years after uh, such economic uh, successful development. Will they maintain current uh, one-party uh, dictatorship or they will come to uh, Western-style democracy? a Western-style capitalist like me. But maybe a Western-style capitalist understands China better than the Asians understand China. Mm. It's a very aggressive, capitalistic, somewhat lawless in certain ways society. Spontaneous, innovative, extremely ambitious. We have many Chinese in the United States. They do very well. Good students, want the best for their people. Tight family units. This is an economist making social comments. 
uh, Japan looked for a while like they would run the world. But there were flaws in its model. The culture of Japan is very different than the culture of China. And so if, my guess would be, short of political conflict, territorial uh, designs, which don't make a lot of sense in a nuclear-driven uh, world, that uh, China will be more Western, capitalistic-like, uh, and influence spread all over the world, quite wealthy, uh, and a responsible global citizen. That's a positive, bright view. I don't think I share the view that it is a totalitarian or one-party rule government. It's just too big uh, an economy not to have tremendous amount of decentralization, but on very key policy issues and very key elements of what's important to the future of China, the Chinese government does step in and tell people what to do. They just told Google what Google could not do. And Google will apparently leave China. Uh, and uh, China will not bend on that. Uh, it fixes the currency, and nobody can change their mind. So it's mixed in the sense it's not totalitarian. It doesn't dominate. It's not socialist in the sense that it runs all the sources of production, but is, is, is a guider and an aggressive guider. It's a different kind of system than totalitarian militaristic regimes. And my guess is the material way of life for a society like that will dominate and they'll be more Western-like. I have the same view of India. I was at a conference in Aspen. Uh, just two economists there. These were social thinkers, uh, people from all walks of life. We had some business people from India. And I got lectured on the lack of spirit, spirit uh, the materialism of America and how we had wrecked up the world and Wall Street had done such terrible damage. And I admitted that I'm a capitalist, uh, maybe greedy at times, and I was part of the world. And that, yes, I don't think we're very spiritual in the way that India is. But I said, you know what? At the end of the day, you're going to be just like us because you like all those good things of life. And afterwards, after this discussion, a gentleman came up to me, maybe 35, 4-year-old Indian, who turned out to be the head of a private equity firm who told me uh, he and a bunch of his friends had gone to a Harvard Business School executive session. Many of you have probably been to these. And there they were in the classroom with their Blackberries buying and selling stocks in the middle of the class. So what's new? Uh, I think they actually have something on us in the spiritual sense. Uh, America's gotten probably too materialistic. But uh, my guess on China is they're, they're very, we think in America, we think they're very much like us uh, in a lot of ways. We don't think the Japanese are like us at all. <laughs> and so, uh, and I, I don't mean that critically. You know, it's just a different culture. So uh, in one sense, uh, I envy the Chinese. In another sense, I fear them as a competitor. Uh, and I guess I do think they'll end up more Western-like and responsible in order to make their way in the world and to make money for their people. The standard of living will get to them just like it gets to lots of societies around the world. I'm going to put the floor. Um, Dr. Sinai, I, um, well, thank you for your lecture. Um, given your, um, I have just one short question, uh, given your forecast for 2010 and beyond, uh, which is basically rosy for Asia and not so rosy for G7, and given the state that the US and uh, the Obama administration is in, um, obviously there's going to be imbalances in the world economy. So my question to you is, um, what do you think the G20 ought to do or can do uh, to address some of these imbalances? Not just imbalances between Asia and G7, but also uh, imbalances within uh, the developing world, imbalances between Asia and Latin America and, and Africa and things like that. So, um, what is the advice you would give? Yes, yeah, so let me be very, very brief and just give two or three answers. On Global imbalances, which may not be number one on the list, uh, my list, but uh, global imbalances, the glaring imbalances exist 
because of the fixed exchange rate in China. And the G20 should in, encourage China to find a, a mechanism by which they exit from a fixed exchange rate regime. Clearly, it cannot be a 20% upward revaluation. That would be too big a shock. And so a gradual uh, movement uh, and allowing of the currency to move up is perhaps the best way uh, to do that. And that would, that would uh, over time, do something about the trade imbalances that are so striking. And there are, of course, imbalances relating to trade and currencies in Asia, which is part of the reason why so many countries are selling currencies to prevent their currencies from getting too high relative to China. So that stands out as a glaring problem. For the world as a whole, uh, the movement toward more consumerism and more spending by consumers in China, in Japan, should be encouraged. And actually, the weakness of the American consumer in the long run is healthy, in my view, because we spent too much, we borrowed too much for too long. On, again, imbalances, the United States should be encouraged, if not lectured, on the huge deficits uh, that we are running and the debt to GDP ratios that are going on, because there are other ways out besides spending and taxing to, to deal with that. Uh, on the financial crises in the aftermath, the global community has not yet, and neither has a lot of individual countries, resolved the regulatory and supervisory framework, the rules of the game for what I call the animal spirits of the financial system, of which I am one of those, which if not set properly and delicately, those animal spirits will run amok. And I don't, I'm not critical of that. These are bright, well-paid people, know how to make money, know how to get around rules, don't break the law in most cases, but walk the fine edge of the line and actually use government bailouts as part of strategy to make sure they make more money. Well, we should know what the game is of this sector and harness it by setting the rules and regulations. We haven't done that yet. I'm fearful that in our country they're going to be too punitive, hurt the supply of capital that will energize our country. I have no doubt that capital will flow freely in Asia uh, and energetically so in part of the growth prospect of Asia. So G20 should get cracking on that so we come to a resolution of the rules and regulations within which the financial spirits can be penned for the good of society rather than what happened in the United States. There are others, but we have only a limited amount of time. Thank you, Dr. Simon, for your insightful presentation. I'm Julian Kim of the Research Institute. I have a question about the Japanese economy. As you said, Japan is also experiencing high depreciation and also uh, low economic power. Even though with that situation, the Japan is, and is experiencing high appreciation since last year. So what do you think about this reasons for this uh, high and uh, rapid of uh, given the state of the Japanese economy, zero interest rates, uh, part of the answer, I think, is the uh, diversification of uh, foreign exchange reserves that has been going on all around the world, uh, away from the dollar as a single reserve currency. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the U.S. situations I described, if, if, if it were roughly right, you wouldn't want to own only dollars in dollar denominated assets. It's too risky. Mm -hmm. The U.S. future is a doubt. And of course, uh, those who have investments all around the world and central banks holding foreign exchange reserves and governments have actually, over time, been diversifying away from the dollar, which is part of the dollar decline. And diversifying toward, because there is no other single item to replace the dollar as the global reserve currency, not the pound sterling, but the yen is a recipient of those demands, and that we think is part of the strength. The other is the Japanese policy making. Uh, there is no clear-cut sign and signal from Japan that they want a lower currency. It's a puzzle. They're a big exporting country. Their businesses should be complaining uh, and pushing the Ministry of Finance. But here's the problem, and here's why they don't. The Ministry of Finance, I think, and I had meetings with them, does want to see a lower yen. The new Prime Minister of Japan, 
not clear because he's been there only a short time. And the new head of the Ministry of Finance, his area of background is not economics and finance. And he's only in there a short period of time. But at the Ministry of Finance, the so-called quote-unquote bureaucrats, because it's the right economic answer, I think, do want a lower yen. But how do they do that? They can tell the prime minister that they think that's what should happen, and the prime minister might say yes, and then Ma tells the Bank of Japan to sell yen or buy other currencies. Uh, but nobody will join them. Uh, the U.S. doesn't want a stronger dollar. We have our own problems. We're going too slowly. Uh, the uh, uh, Eurozone doesn't want a stronger euro. They already have too low inflation and uh, not a weak economy. So nobody will join Japan in, in intervention. It's one way to take the currency down. And uh, they have a trillion dollars of foreign exchange reserves. They'll just waste it. So they're not going to do that. So what's left? Well, the central bank, if the central bank were a leader on the currency, which the Bank of Japan is not. The Bank of Japan has been an assistant on currency movements driven by the government of Japan in past years. They are not in the habit of striking out and talking about a lower currency. Indeed, since Bob Rubin was U.S. Treasury Secretary, central banks have been in the habit of staying out of currency affairs and treasuries have stayed out of central banking affairs. But Japan's Bank of Japan has a goal of price stability. They don't have price stability. It's minus 1% year over year. It would be quite appropriate for the Bank of Japan to say, we think the currency should be lower so we can achieve our goal of price stability. This, this was my advice. But it's, they would be wearing a different uniform. They have never done that. Well, we all know that in any country, that's not easy to do. So it would be out of character. The other device, of course, is to lower interest rates, but they can't lower interest rates anymore. So all, the, all that Japan has left to do to take the currency down and to get behind a decline in the currency, other than wait for the currency to go down on its own, which it will, which it will. When interest rates start to go up everywhere else and then that interest rate differential grows, that yen will come down. But it may be very late. It may be farther behind the curve in, on the deflation. All they have left is enlarged and increased uh, quantitative ease, expanding the balance sheet by the Bank of Japan to expand the balance sheet and to announce they're doing it. And, and the market did react when they did this in December. Uh, they did react. The, the currency did go, go down some. And the currency went down when uh, Mr. Khan made a comment about 95. So the markets are just kind of waiting to take advantage of Japan when and if they decide that they want to get behind the currency and push it down. Uh, beyond those explanations, uh, I cannot tell you other than uh, there is a home bias in Japan for almost all things Japan, including their own currency, which may explain uh, it partly. Dr. Sana, it's really delighted to listen to you again. Um, the world economy has recovered. Uh, as you said, the much quicker and faster than expected. Mm -hmm. I think this performance uh, is a great extent attributed to a global international coordination of my stimulus package and so on and so on, as you described. Now, my question is that the, can you do similar things in design access strategy? For example, in Korea, well, Korea in fact performed uh, the fastest recovery among OECD economies. Uh, some economies here in Korea talking about that we should now apply some sort of the exit strategy. But majority think that the event is still premature and the Korea should continue a stimulus package at least until the middle of the second quarter of this year. And so my question is that what is your view? Korea should wait until how other big countries you know, do and uh, what, what is your position on this uh, uh, collective action on the access strategy. And the second question is uh, having a global imbalance issues. So what is your view on the current battle, extreme battle, great battle between China and the US? Uh, I think that to recover, uh, to correct global imbalance, Chinese yuan should be, be, uh, be valued, and uh, Chinese are uh, rather 
spare on that. So I would like to hear your view of you this. Finally, this is actually the request from my colleagues sitting right here. In the limited time, he asked me to raise the question. Uh, many of the extremists uh, in, in containing the cross border flow of the heavy guns uh, uh, so argue that we should apply the Tobin tax. And as uh, you know, Professor Tobin they claim that to control, to regulate the cross border flow of this state related heavy funds. So, what is your view on this in designing the financial architecture? Thank you. The policy uh, and exit strategies a number of countries have to face. Uh, this is difficult territory for the policymakers. They haven't had to do this. Uh, and a number of countries have to deal with exiting from zero rate and some form of quantitative easing. Uh, in the United States, uh, our Federal Reserve is shutting down the quantitative easing in those areas where it's no longer needed. For example, in the financial system, those firms that are left are fine. Two of them reported poor results, but a year from now, Citigroup and Bank of America will be reporting profits. So uh, they are winding down. Uh, some of the uh, funds flows into the private sector, not right away the funds flows into the asset-backed securities that go to consumers and small business. And a real problem in our case is what to do about the mortgage supply into the housing market which is now essentially a government-owned uh, operation. Uh, and uh, the Federal Reserve is uh, ending its purchases of mortgage-backed securities. But that's still in debate because we need for housing to have mortgage supply. Then interest rates will be raised. They will first do it on the, on the rate on bank reserves. Uh, and then the federal funds rate will go up. And we, do th we think we'll be at three-quarters of a percentage point on the federal funds rate at the end of this year. But it's quantitative easing tapered first, and then interest rates still far below what might normally be required on the kind of forecast I gave you for the U.S. Uh, that may, may, uh, may do it uh, would, would be perhaps the way they go out. But this is very tricky territory. However, uh, Chairman Bernanke and the Federal Reserve have been very ingenious in this. So I have a lot of confidence that they'll invent ways to exit quantitative easing, quantity side, cleverly. And already we had a very clever uh, new deposit instrument. Because here's the problem. They've got to get those excess reserves sopped up out of the banking system. Huge amount of excess reserves in the banking system, which if deployed in credit, would lead to inflation. So how do you sop up those reserves without selling a lot of treasuries and mortgage-backed securities and driving those interest rates up and interfering with the US economies? recovery and expansion. So they invent a, a, an instrument of deposit. They will pay the banks some interest. The banks will buy them, and they'll sop up the reserves that way. It's an alternative to selling. So it's very clever. Uh, and uh, so I think they'll be fine. Exit policy on fiscal, very difficult in our country, because it's wrapped up in politics and the societal objectives, the social goals of the Obama administration. Example, insure the uninsured on health care socially a worthy objective. It's one of the reasons I voted for Obama. I thought, I want to see that happen. Most of the world has its citizenry insured. We have 30, 40 million Americans who don't have health insurance. More walk around with pre-existing conditions they can't get insurance. So as a social matter, I think that's unacceptable. But now to do that, we have this health care program which looks very costly and it's not going to deal with healthcare inflation. Real problem. I think exit from the deficits and debt is uh, next to uh, impossible here uh, to, uh, to do in the practical realities of uh, the U.S. situation. As for Korea, and generally on exiting, or what I say, getting ahead of the curve, uh, I've seen a lot of policy making all over the world in lots of business cycles. One thing to me is very clear. It's always too late. Preemptive policy is better, better to be early and wrong and reverse it than to, to be too late and get behind the curve. The dynamics of the business cycle overwhelm policymakers. And inherently, it's going to be late anyway. You have deliberative bodies having to discuss and figure out what's going on. So there's a recognition lag, there's an implementation lag, and then there are the lags in the, in the system. So you can never be early enough. Now, on that view, if I were at the Fed, I'd be raising interest rates now as a preemptive way. Uh, 
but we were very late in lowering them. The, the downturn was well in process when that happened. So applying that to Korea, I would be arguing for higher interest rates earlier rather than waiting. And looking at the numbers of Korea, now of course our forecast is more, more ebullient, more stronger than most, but I'm looking at Asia, and Asia trade numbers are really strong. Uh, I would probably start raising interest rates now, not in big lumps. I would start early. I would start early because uh, <laughs> once an economy gets going on the demand side, then you need much larger. This, after all, interest rates are a price. It rations. It does. It's, it's not like shutting things off with quantity controls like the Chinese do. Uh, interest rates are a very uh, not effective instrument to accomplish much in the short run unless you move them up very sharply. But that's a shock. To do that quickly is a shock. So better to start early. And so that would be my advice. Mm. But I have uh, no thought that policymakers will be preemptive. I have the same view about illness and medicine. Mm. Some illnesses you can do nothing about. Uh, before I leave, I'm going to go work out at the fitness center. It's all I know about how to keep myself healthier so I can have a higher quality of life and maybe live a few days longer. But that's preemptive. That's preventive. We don't do enough of that in policy. Okay. And you had the Tobin tax, securities tax. Uh, I have actually proposed that in our country uh, and as a way as a deficit neutral tax change with stimulative reductions in taxes, in this case social security taxes, to increase growth and reduce joblessness and to finance it with a securities tax, which is sector specific, which is an excise tax that would be passed on. It would not damage much. It might damage the financial sector a little bit, but the power of the stimulus of Social Security tax reductions or income tax reductions is much stronger. We grow more, we'd have less joblessness, and we could finance it. Now, that particular tax is a concern if it is only done in one or two countries. Most people will argue it should be done everywhere, and I don't think there's any way that the global community is going to agree on that. I happen to think it can be done in a given country and that financial institutions won't leave on a small Securities transaction tax. It's one. It is being considered in the U.S. Congress. Uh, I don't think it would survive the lobbying efforts of the financial community. So I don't think it will happen. It also happens to be the view of one of the most liberal Democratic economists, a great hero of mine, Jim Tobin. I knew him. Uh, I, one of the greatest economists ever in our country. Uh, but he. It, it's a, it's a very liberal economic view, and I don't think politically. Uh, it can fly in our country. But I am arguing for it behind closed doors of the halls of Congress. Nathan's question related to Korea. How great recession of 2007 and 2009 would affect the Korean economy and her employment problems? Is the prospect of the Korean economy rosy in the year 2010? in your view? If so, what would be her growth rate expected? Yes, uh, we are optimistic on the South Korean growth rate in 2010 and 11 to the tune of around 6% real growth. Uh, that means also that inflation we think will be a little higher than what most forecasts have inflation in the country and we would expect the Central Bank of South Korea to raise interest rates a little more than most people think. As for the slack in the unemployment as a uh, outgrowth of the sharp decline that occurred last year, rehiring and, and, and labor, uh, hiring of labor lags uh, the output gains in most countries these days. And um, I think uh, most companies given uh, how they deal with costs and the holding down of costs for the purpose of making profits, uh, all around the world will be more reluctant to rehire and so unemployment rates will linger higher longer in many countries, including South Korea, after the 
upturn and output. So view on this, uh, the way the way companies are run these days. It, it's a view of the behavior of executives of companies and how they handle making money for their shareholders more than a view of economics. And uh, given the uh, easy substitutability of technology for labor and increasing uh, portion of economies that are in services, which is information and technology intensive, uh, and the uh, cheapness of so much of information technology for people, whether it's robotics, automatic answering of the phones, using the internet and not agents, inter intermediaries in buying and selling stocks or making airline reservations, the propensity of business and running business is to hire less labor uh, than more labor, and that says to me higher unemployment for a given growth rate of output than typically used to be the case. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sainai. The next uh, very short question is uh, very uh, recently the U.S. election, the dominant uh, market camp is uh, now uh, a little changing. So how do you foresee or forecast that the Obama market administration to feed that and how to make the uh, overseas uh, foreign policy, uh, exactly the African Eastern uh, reinforcement policy and uh, domestically the uh, welfare and the uh, countermeasure of this uh, subprime mortgage uh, uh, policy. How do you foresee this uh, change? Because the uh, power structure or democracy and Republican really changing now? Uh, I think the question is, uh, in light of uh, a, a potentially changing political climate in the United States, which is not favoring the Democrats in the Obama administration, how will that impact on their policy? Uh, and this is uh, particularly striking uh, on the election of a Republican, conservative Republican in Massachusetts, my home state uh, yesterday, uh, which does take away uh, the uh, ability of the Democrats to pass some kind of health care legislation. Uh, I watch the polls carefully. I have been advising for a year and a half uh, the House Democratic leadership. Uh, and uh, we follow Washington quite closely. Uh, the uh, Obama administration and the president has turned out to be uh, more quote unquote liberal than perhaps many non-Republican party Americans thought. Uh, and the uh, a liberal state like Massachusetts electing a conservative Republican to replace the most liberal senator in our history is a sign and signal and symptom and message to the Obama administration, in my view, that they should move toward the center and away from the left. It's clear cut, it's in the polls. Uh, anecdotally for me, where I live, which is in the uh, Northeast Park, Boston area, uh, loaded with liberal Democrats. I myself am politically neutral, I'm center of the road. Uh, I'm socially liberal and fiscally on the conservative side, uh, but not always, and uh, I think uh, he, the administration has missed where the American collective head is, and this election is a sign and symptom. But I don't know what the reaction will be. I know what I would do. What I would do is what Clinton did. He moved quickly to the center. He dropped lots of liberal ideas. He borrowed Republican ideas, put them into place, and may have been, other than his small problem with Miss Lewinsky and a few other women, maybe they weren't problems, he was having fun. You know, it's okay, maybe. Uh, but other than that, he really was a quite bright president, policy-wise. We had a wonderful decade in the 1990s. Uh, 
Uh, I, I would quickly move to the center. I would change some of the advisors uh, because there's time between now and November to change the perception of America and for him to understand where Americans are. He's just turned out to be too liberal for them. If he doesn't do that, I think he's going to suffer badly in the off year elections. And I'm not sure whether we'll get any policy at all out of Washington. And we do need some of these policies to get done. Uh, we're confused at the moment. We'll see how he behaves. Chief executives of the countries behave different ways. George Bush, uh, the second George Bush, was very stubborn. He didn't change his views. Tunnel vision <laughs> went straight on. One way. And, and, and we know what the world reaction was to that. That was his way. Bill Clinton, he would change his mind. Ronald Reagan, viewed as a conservative Republican. I always said Ronald Reagan, because everyone thought he was dumb. You know? Yeah, he wasn't very smart. Came out of the movies. And I would provoke audiences again and again by giving speeches on how smart I thought Ronnie Reagan was. Why did I think he was smart? One reason was he never listened to economists. He was his own economist. That was always good for a laugh. It still is. It's almost 30 years later. And you know, when Ronnie Reagan ran into a wall, he bounced off, turned around, and went the other way. He was not as died in the wool conservative as everybody thinks. We'll see what Obama is like. We don't know, and so I can't nearly answer your question about what it does to policy until I see how he and the people around him react. Typically, the people around the president are very stubborn. They think they know the answers, they stay the course, and they lose. And that's the message of this election. Hmm. We'll see what kind of a, 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 we'll see what, a, you know, if he changes his mind, it doesn't bother me. In politics, I think you can change your mind as often as an economist changes his forecast, which is 30 seconds after you give a forecast. And I'll close on that note. Uh, I reserve the right to change my mind on anything I said today, 30 yeah. seconds after I said it. I'm a forecaster. Okay. I can do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I wish you we could keep this uh, morning session, but uh, keep uh, continuing. But uh, this, uh, I think, uh, has a uh, time limitation, and uh, Ireland Sinai has two more sessions to go today somewhere in Seoul, and uh, he has to leave this evening for the States again back. And uh, I think it was very uh, useful again, uh, very informative and very lively uh, discussions, exchange of views, and uh, I think uh, we should uh, give some uh, regards to uh, Alan Sainé for his uh, future uh, works. Thank you very much. Thanks so much.